Okay, so good morning and welcome to everybody who's logged in. Um, we might as well kick off now. <clears throat> so welcome to Fleming Medical, one of our first of what we hope is going to be a long line of webinars. Um, so today we're going to cover COPD. We're going to look at what is COPD, an overview of COPD in the community. We're going to look at COPD related products and an overview of them. And we'll just run through some of the main products that you'll see um, day to day in your pharmacy, people coming in looking for um, in relation to COPD. Um, so my name is Teresa. I've been working as key account manager with Fleming Medical for two and a half years now. Um, I have always worked before that in retail pharmacy, except for maybe four years. So for about 15 years, uh, I've worked in retail pharmacy, working as a retail manager and as a pharmacy technician. And I'm joined today by James Rehel. So James can introduce himself. Yeah, I'm James. I look after the, the education of our medical devices. And so um, my role would be to upskill and make sure that people know the limitations and uses for all their medical devices. Um, and I suppose the pharmaceutical products here today, um, I'd be just giving you a background as to where you could maybe best utilize them and how they can best most benefit your, your patients or um, clients coming into your pharmacy. Okay, James. Super. Uh, so we we'll start at the start, I'd imagine. Um, as Teresa said, yeah, my role is uh, training special it's a really long title there's lots of words and letters in it uh, but primarily what we aim to achieve is if you buy anything from Fleming Medical be it a dressing or a nebulizer right through to uh, some of our uh, ICU devices that you would know the ins and outs of it how to use it in an emergency situation or an everyday use um, and how it interacts with your patients and how they can be best use it um, for the best achievable outcome. So today we were asked to cover COPD. Um, in another life, I'm a nurse in the emergency department in Galway um, and COPD has, well, prior to COVID was huge. Um, so every day we would expect to see an exacerbation of COPD or patients presenting with exacerbations of COPD. Um, an exacerbation of COPD, which we will cover in the next few slides, is a worsening in condition or an inflammation of a condition that causes uh, a lot of stress, anxiety, breathlessness, and many other things. But to start, we'll have a basic overview of our lungs. So everybody has lungs in order to be compatible with life, and our lungs are very good at the role they do. So what we've two main tasks when we look at our lungs. One is to inhale air and the second being to exhale. And if we do that, a lot of us do it subconsciously. I know I do, I'm not very mindful of my breathing. Thankfully, I don't hope to be at any stage because if you are, generally speaking, it means that your, your subconscious or your parasympathetic nervous system is bringing your, your attention to your breathing for some reason. Um, and lung diseases, there's many, many lung diseases out there from the most obvious being asthma, right through to uh, lung cancer, to uh, bronchitis, to cystic fibrosis, to um, many, 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 many diseases out there. But in the medical world, um, lung diseases are generally classified in one or two one of two um, conditions so one being obstructive um, and uh, are restrictive and what that them two words refer to obstructive and restrictive is does this lung condition primarily affect breathing in or does it primarily affect breathing out and with COPD we refer to it as an obstructive lung disease. Um, and generally speaking, obstructive means that it's harder to exhale. Um, and you're having your primary issue there is exhaling air. Um, and COPD, there's hundreds of definitions of it. But what the easiest way to remember is it's a permanent uh, long-term damage to the lining and the the lining of the lungs, basically. And in order to classify COPD, you have to have two conditions. 
One is chronic bronchitis, and the second is uh, emphysema. So in a standard lung, um, we have um, an airway or a pharynx, larynx, right down to your trachea, which is your windpipe, and then it goes into the bronchus and bronchioles. So tiny little tubes then that feed into your right and left lung. And at the end of these tubes, we have alveoli. When we breathe in, air follows that path right down from our airway, right into our alveoli. Alveoli are, if you remember from first or second year of biology in school, alveoli is where tiny little sacs, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of them, uh, are there and they're responsible for a gaseous exchange or gas exchange. So when you breathe in air, what it looks to do is oxygenate blood and then it'll expel unwanted gases. And when you breathe out, then you'll be expiring the CO2 and the unwanted gases out there. So two conditions that you need in order to be classified as having COPD. One is chronic bronchitis. The chronic bronchitis then will affect the bronchioles or the, the tubes just before the alveoli. Um, and what happens there is it damages the lining of them tubes. When somebody has bronchitis even, um, what happens is there's an inflammation of that, that lining. What that does is it causes a production of mucus. Sometimes there can be a cough, a chronic cough. Um, and then the other aspect of it being emphysema, emphysema affects the alveoli, so the sacs of air uh, right down at the base of the lungs. And our alveoli are, were, are brilliant uh, at the job they do in that every time we breathe in, they will expand um, and they'll take the air in. And every time we breathe out, they kind of narrow again and wait for the collection of new air. But when somebody has emphysema, the elasticity or the expansion um, capacity of them alveoli is, is damaged. Um, so instead of opening and closing in a really nice synchronized manner, we've now lost the elasticity over time um, and that will cause us problems. So now we won't be able to breathe in or out as effectively as we should. That will cause problems um, for us. Um, so what does... Here's another definition of what COPD is. It's a non-reversible deterioration and airflow to the lungs caused by damage to tissue. When somebody has COPD coming into your pharmacies, I'd imagine a lot of them would know they have it. I know in Ireland there's about 200,000 undiagnosed cases in Ireland, uh, but about 300,000 or 350,000 people are diagnosed with COPD in Ireland um, as of last year, I believe that um, them stats were. And um, so it's a huge, huge issue in Ireland. Uh, almost 90% and above of cases are directly linked to cigarette smoking. Um, so it's the most obvious thing to do when anybody presents to your pharmacy, they might tell you that they have COPD. It's always worth asking them, if they still smoke or, um, and would they be interested in any of your, your uh, tobacco cessation products or whatever else you might may be able to offer them. And um, exacerbations of COPD are where the issue lies. So COPD, we can't treat it. Uh, we can treat it, apologies, but we can't cure it. Um, and what we can do is we're looking to slow down the disease progression. As time goes on, your lung capacity and your lung health will deteriorate if you fail to take any of the steps necessary. Um, and what that will look like to the untrained eye is that the wheeze will get more audible, the breathlessness will get worse, their color, um, the color of a person's skin may change, maybe um, a cyanide or a blue or gray pallor color in the lips. Um, and you'll often see patients with COPD that they'd be hunched over and leaning a lot um, whilst talking or at rest. And that is that. Uh, how do you diagnose COPD? There's a gold standard tool called a spirometry test. A spirometry test is a very simple test generally done in an outpatient's department in, well, used to be prior to COVID. I'm not sure if there's any spirometry being done at the minute. Um, and what it does is it looks for two numbers. So you, they put a tube into the patient's mouth, cover their nose and ask them to forcefully exhale air. Um, and they're trying to measure 
your expired air and put a number on that. Um, and you could look into that if you, in more detail if you want, but that's the general principle of spirometry. It takes two numbers, an FBC, which is a forced vital capacity, and the forced expired volume of air. Now, they're both very technical terms, but that's how you diagnose uh, COPD. So you're looking for it. And also, when you look at COPD in terms of, right, this person may be breathless. They're presenting here to your, your pharmacy today. They're very breathless. You can hear them wheezing. Um, and they also have a slight cough. The, all three of them kind of symptoms are very much linked with asthma as well. If you had somebody with asthma um, and they had an exacerbation of their asthma, you, you, they'd also have a very similar presentation to your um, front counter. So how do we differentiate between COPD and asthma? Um, and it's very simple. When somebody is asked to do a spirometry test, they're always given a, a beta-2 agonist or salbutamol um, to you and I. And the salbutamol, it, we look for a response. So you'd ask somebody to do a spirometry test, you'd ask them to forcefully expire air. We take that number for what it is, and then you'd be giving them a salbutamol. And if there's a good response to the salbutamol, that's considered to be asthma. Um, and not COPD. If you have a COPD patient, it doesn't matter whether you give them salbutamol or not, you're not going to get a good reaction um, to, on a spirometry test to them. So that's kind of the placebo effect, uh, if you want. So that's how we know that this patient, when diagnosed, has not been misdiagnosed as a, as a chronic asthma over a chronic COPD. Um, few stats. Uh, it's the fourth leading cause of death worldwide with 380,000 diagnosed cases and an estimated 200,000 undiagnosed cases in Ireland last year. It's pretty similar in the UK. We've about 10, um, we've about 10 percent of the cases that the UK has, um, but it still lies in around the fourth leading cause of death in the UK as well. Any problem or issue in healthcare that has a huge amount of numbers of patients attending with this issue obviously comes with a huge financial burden um, and that's nobody's fault really but we can get a lot better at managing this and particularly in COVID times that we need to manage this more far more so in the community and um, to stop these really acute exacerbations and um, and lung damage to people. Um, another few symptoms, uh, signs and symptoms would be a, a cough several times a day. Um, or the, the cough is very similar to a, what people would describe as a smoker's cough. A smoker's cough is generally, it's a, a chronic bronchitis. Uh, and it's a cough that's been there for more than three months and three weeks. Um, there's no bacterial element to it. it like it's not, it's not an infection. It's not present with a temperature. It's just a cough that's persistent. It's always there, maybe a lot worse in the morning, might be a production of phlegm all day. Um, and that's that. A wheeze is something that may come and go depending on positioning. So somebody with COPD, when they're lying flat, their wheeze might be more audible to them. Um, and then the breathlessness, Breathlessness is something that should never be underestimated. It's probably one of the most difficult things for any patient or customer. Sorry, I keep referring to everybody as patient, and it's my, uh, <laughs> my nursing background that I can't uh, jump away from the word patient. They're customers to you. Um, but when somebody is very breathless, it's very alarming it's very anxiety inducing panic inducing and, and there's a lot of fear uh, surrounding breathlessness it's an awful sensation i'd imagine um, and last but not least is the smoking up to 90 percent of cases are directly linked to cigarette smoking so ask the patient or the customer if there is if they still smoke if they do ask them would they consider stopping um, and what we're doing there is we're not trying to play a doctor or whatever um, but what we are trying to do is promote good health um, and cigarette smoking needs to be stopped to limit disease progression and COPD. Um, if 
yeah, back to the signs and symptoms. Um, somebody with COPD will have a cough, they'll have uh, overproduction of mucus, and they'll be breathless. Now, the breathlessness has, there's a scale of dyspnea or breathlessness. It's graded from one to five. One being that you'd get breathless on exertion and five being that you can't leave the house as a direct result that if you stand up out of the chair that you get really breathless and you have to sit down again. Five being the most extreme and one being the, um, the least extreme version of it, but one is still COPD. Um, then a few things to note that lung cancers, um, fibrosis and heart failure can sometimes present with similar symptoms. I know we're not trying to diagnose anybody in a pharmacy or in an outpatient setting like this, but if somebody does come into you um, and they said that they're, they're, um, they're after coughing up some blood or something similar to that, um, but they say to you, but don't worry, I have COPD, uh, hemoptysis or coughing up blood is rarely linked to COPD. Another thing that's rarely linked is any chest pain. So if somebody comes in and says, oh, I think I, I have a little bit of a worsening of my COPD, but I've, 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 I've quite a bad chest pain at the minute, um, that that would be another red flag for you. Um, and then if there's any sudden change in their condition, obviously ask them to maybe attend their local emergency department or their GP. Um, just a few signs and symptoms to look out for. Um, yeah, COPD in at the present time is really, really difficult. I'm not sure about the NHS, but I know the HSE, I know we've colleagues here from the UK at the minute, don't we, mm -hmm. Trisa? Yep. Um, so in the NHS, I'm not sure how your emergency departments work at the minute, but I can tell you firsthand in Ireland that if somebody presents to, to any emergency department in the country, with an exacerbation of COPD at the minute, they'll be or they will go a red stream. And um, so EDs have been broken up into a green stream and a red stream emergency department. Green stream being that they've ticked the COVID questionnaire and we've no COVID concerns uh, about them. But COPD ticks all the red flags for COVID. So they will be sent through a red pathway. Um, these patients may potentially come into contact with people who have COVID or who are awaiting a COVID diagnosis. People with COPD are not people that we want uh, to get COVID, and they'd be on the far riskier side of, of the diagnosis. Um, so it's really up to public health medicine and us as the general public and the patients themselves to take a really proactive stance in maintaining good health um, and try to keep that for as long as they could. And um, there's a few things that all pharmacy staff, whether you're a pharmacist or whether you're, it's your first day working in the retail side of a pharmacy, um, these are all names that might be familiar to you um, and can be used in the treatment of COPD. Something like a beta-2 agonist like a salbutamol is really good. Uh, it's a short-acting dilator, so it, um, and then you've the the bromide and the likes of them, and the bromide would aim to break down the mucus. Um, so they're the two things that we said you need to have COPD at the start. To have COPD, you have a chronic and um, chronic bronchitis. The chronic bronchitis presents as a lot of phlegm and really it's the airways going into the alveoli. Um, but when you have an overproduction of phlegm, it's really difficult to cough it up. If you have emphysema, you're, you're obviously you're on the back foot already because you can't, as we said, it's obstructive. So your difficulty lies in getting air out of your lungs. Um, and that's the exact same for phlegm, that you're going to have a diff if you're having a difficulty expelling air from your lungs, it's going to be the exact same when you're trying to expel uh, phlegm or water or any other product from your lungs. It's all the same. So bromide or the likes of them products can break down the mucus and um, it's easier for the patient then to cough it up. It, it's coughed up in smaller particles then. The more terms that you might be familiar with are long acting beta agonists like a LABA or LAMAS. Um, and what they are are basically longer acting versions of your salbutamol or your bromide. Um, I know I'm not a pharmaceutical rep, so I leave the rest to the pharma. 
people. Um, but these might be terms that you might see or hear people asking for. Um, and if you hear or see them asking for these, it's, it's always good to try and increase your own awareness of COPD. It doesn't matter what grade you are in a pharmacy, what your role is. Um, you're, you're on the front line of public health in your role, whether, whether it's just a strictly retail role that you have or your pharmacy technician or your pharmacist. Um, we all have a role in promoting good, positive health and changes to lifestyles um, in order to get the best achievable outcome for everybody. Um, and that is that. An exacerbation of COPD. Obviously, we say that COPD is a chronic condition, chronic meaning that um, it's been there for a long time and we're not going to, to completely cure this. We're never going to cure it, I don't think, in my lifetime anyway. Um, but treatment methods to prolong or to slow disease progression are always advancing. Um, so that's either pharmaceutical or as its devices such as um, or nebulizers, be it portable or fixed uh, or whatever else. There's loads of steps that people can take to keep themselves well. It's really important that when somebody has COPD, that they monitor their good days, um, that they're not just coming into any of your pharmacists when things get bad. And you should always try and instill that in people that if they're coming in just to collect a regular prescription that you might have a chat with them uh, um, and say how are, how is your COPD at the minute um, obviously a pharmacy is something that you build up a relationship and trust over time so if you feel like you can have that conversation that may be a good conversation to have ask them do you use a peak flow meter a peak flow meter is Teresa go through all this in more detail in a while, but uh, it's a really good tool to, to monitor disease progression. So what it is, it's a small plastic device. And what you do is you take a really big deep breath in, you cover the seal of the plastic with your lips and forcefully exhale. You do that three times and take the best number. And what it does is it gives a number to the expired air. So if it's 650 liters uh, or if it's 200 liters, but we really want to know what this person is like when they consider themselves well. Um, and that way we can judge and you can judge uh, how and the, the client or the patient or who, whatever, sorry, I can't get away from that word, patient. Um, they will know themselves then how severe this current exacerbation is. So if they're Monday to Friday and um, they're feeling 80 90 percent well um and they're doing peak flow meters maybe once or twice a week or even once a day if they're brilliant uh, at looking after their own health and their average number is probably about four five hundred uh, probably they're they're very um uh, hopeful numbers to be getting with chronic copd or emphysema but if you've got a good number of three four hundred say uh, keep a diary of this, ask them to write down every week or every month what your number is. You'll start to notice that before you are almost aware of uh, the acute exacerbation or the worsening in state of the COPD, that if you take your peak flow meter, now last week you were at 300 liters a minute, now you're at 200. This is probably, it's, probably, it's a really good indication that something is not as good as it was last week. Um, so now you're on top of your um, COPD. So now would it be time to come back in to your local general practitioner or even your pharmacist um, to, to make sure that you're taking your medication properly or that you have your uh, medication, you're taking it all on time. Um, exacerbations of COPD happen quite a bit more so in winter than they would in summertime. Um, and in hospital, this, uh, if, if people attend their GP, generally what might happen is they give them a course of steroids, uh, prednisolone or regular inhalers, nebulizers, antibiotics, if there's evidence of bacterial infection. Um, they might ask them if they go to a physiotherapist. Physiotherapy is really uh, important in COPD, really underutilized, uh, maybe because it's an under-resourced profession. 
Um, but it's really good. A good respiratory physio um, is worth its weight in gold. Counseling is often another, it's another tool that's really beneficial. Um, in Ireland, we're, and somewhat in the UK, I used to work there, they're a little bit better at it there than we are at the minute, but um, it's healthcare, it's, it's evolving every day. We still take a very medical model approach to healthcare. And what that means is if somebody's sick, we treat the illness uh, and we treat the exacerbation and we treat, we treat, we're always looking for symptoms in the healthcare. Well, I know for in hospital anyway, we're primarily concerned with the illness. Now, what you do at home, who's at home with you, rarely enters the equation. Um, and I think this is really important. Your role would probably be just as well suited than, than, than any nurse or doctor uh, in advising people that, like any chronic condition takes its weight. Um, it, has, it carries a huge weight. It's really difficult for both the person who's experiencing the COPD, their family, their carers, like um, COPD D generally presents in mid to late forties and progresses as time goes on. But if somebody's 50 and they're now stage three COPD, which is a very progressive stage of COPD, they might not be able to play or throw a ball to their grandparents or they might not you know do this the simple activities of daily living that we all take for granted and um, so if they come in always ask them to um or sometimes if you see it fit to, or appropriate you could ask these patients do would they ever consider counseling um it can be really good and it takes us away from our strict medical model of care um and that is that if you look there at the community aspect what do we need there we need a gp so we need our patients to be linked in with their general practitioner and we need a good pharmacy then as well and um, like everything um like steroids regular inhalers nebulizers antibiotics physios all these tasks um i know we or i definitely do take it for granted that it's easy for people to write a script of prednisolone for 14 days go take uh alpha or regular inhalers, regular nebulizers and antibiotics. So if we take the inhalers and nebulizers question uh, for a minute, uh, just and then I'll hand you over to Teresa. Uh, COPD, right, we've said that you need chronic bronchitis and emphysema to be diagnosed as COPD. Both of them mean that we're having difficulty both breathing in and breathing out, more so on the breathing out. But when the disease progresses, um, it kind of it marries over to both in that we're going to have difficulty with all aspects of breathing. Um, so if you ask somebody with COPD to take regular inhalers and you just tick that box and they go out the door, if they turn up to your pharmacy and with a script and you know this patient from coming in for years or whatever, and you know that he or she um, suffers from COPD and you give them another inhaler, we don't know whether they can actually take that inhaler. Um, and there's lots of studies to say that inhaler techniques um, need to be improved on and worked on and that they're not always um, the best form of drug. It's a really great way to deliver a drug, um, but it's not the best diagnosis to be given somebody um, inhalers for in that if you were asking somebody to take take a really deep breath in so that we can get this drug delivered right down to the base of your lungs and to the alveoli where it's really needed at the minute um, and we step back and we said one minute this person has COPD so how how are we going to achieve that uh, education around inhalers benefits everybody um, if at some stage we will do I know Teresa mentioned it to me before that we do a separate session on inhalers um, and nebulizers just as a standalone subject but inhalers really need education so always ask do you want me to observe you taking your inhaler how do you usually take it uh, all these little tips and tricks and questions they're not invasive you're not trying to you know, get into anybody's space by any means but what you're trying to do is keep them out of hospital if we put a patient with copd into any acute system at the minute and um, they're going to suffer 
one way or the other in that they're going to their family can't visit um first of all first and foremost the family are probably the most important thing to them and um, they're going to go to a red pathway they're going to be query covid um, and the risk when you're query covid is that there's lots of other people who are also query covid um, attending the emergency department um, whether you didn't have it now your risk is increased because you're now in a waiting room with people that are also query COVID. Nebulization therapy versus, um, I just flick down here in nebulization therapy versus inhaler therapy. Um, Teresa talked more about this in a second, but many inhalers uh, are prone to patient error. We've said that before, aerosol, uh, aerosolizing medication uh, provide ef efficient drug delivery through normal breathing. So tidal breathing, what? You and I or somebody else is used to breathing in and out at their standard normal rate. This is the best way that we can deliver um, deliver any aerosol medication via nebulizer. Um, the nebulizer, until recently, it wasn't great um, because we had no LAMA uh, nebulizer available, but I hear that there's a good bit of LAMA and LABA nebulization or uh, nebulizers now available on the market. So this further increases our need to get more nebulizers to patients with COPD. Um, the nebulizer doesn't require a whole lot of technique at all. Um, you're not trying to teach any new way of breathing. Um, you're just telling somebody to put the mask on, select an appropriate mask or pipe or whatever. Um, and then to keep that on for the say seven to 10 minutes or whatever the course of that drug delivery is. Uh, dry powder inhalers are another inhaler that is very common for COPD patients. A dry powder inhaler is so difficult for a patient with COPD to get um, that drug delivered to its, its required destination. Um, so yet again, just be aware that when we ask patients with COPD, to take inhalers that um, obviously this all comes back to your GP again, and that if the GP is prescribing lots of inhalers and very few nebulizers, then there's not much we can do about it. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes a, a doctor's preference, um, but I do know that there is a growing wave of LAM and LABA nebulizers um, and whether they've hit the community pharmacies at the minute, uh, or they're on their way to them. I don't know, but when they do, it will be far more beneficial to a COPD patient, I'd imagine. There's no breathing, it's just general tidal breathing and, um, and the drug is delivered adequately. And that's it from me for now, I'd imagine. So what we covered there was COPD. What is COPD? It's a chronic lung condition. Um, it's irreversible lung tissue damage that happens over time um, and in order to be diagnosed then we went on to how do you diagnose somebody with COPD. The gold standard of testing is what's called a spirometry test. A spirometry test is a breathing test um, that you place a breathing apparatus in the patient's mouth, cover their nose, ask them to forcefully exhale air um, and that forced exhalation is converted into a number and that number helps diagnose COPD for us. How do we treat these people in the community? Ask questions and listen loads uh, is probably the best way. Um, always the differential diagnosis or the risk of somebody with COPD. They've obviously smoked for years. Hopefully they have stopped smoking, um, but the risk of lung cancers is far greater in COPD patients. Um, so always be aware for that sudden change in symptoms that they might tell you, do you know, I'm coughing up with kind of a reddish, I don't think it's blood or some, uh, some questions or red flags. Um, and, and they might just say to themselves, oh, do you know what? Well, I've COPD, so it must be linked to that. Just maybe advise them that, uh, it, you know, maybe it will be worth investigating or you should mention it to your GP the next time you're in. And um, treatment options then in the community for an exacerbation, because we know any chronic condition of the lungs is likely to flare up from time to time. Uh, it comes in peaks and troughs. Um, but what we really need to do is keep these patients as well as they can for as long as they can stay well. 
um, a few tools that we can provide you with for keeping these people well are like your peak flow meter recorded um, um, SpO2 probe. So, um, or SpO2 being a saturation of oxygen. This is a finger probe that's put on the end of a patient's finger um, and it will give you an oxygen reading in numbers. So that, that number ranges from 100 being the most optimal number or the best achievable number right down to zero, which is, you wouldn't see zero, but it, anything below eight or 95, but it, it can drop down into the low 80s with COPD. Um, the other thing is inhalers. Always ask, can you observe him or her using an inhaler? Uh, it will teach you, no matter what your role is, be it a pharmacist or a re part of retail staff, um, whether you just want to see how an inhaler is used because you never really got a direct observation of how it's used. Um, and then uh, nebulizers. Nebulizers are growing. There's a growing support for them in uh, the world of COPD and rightly so it requires zero breathing effort apart from their standard tidal breathing. And um, there used to be a case where obviously we want people with COPD or every illness to live a full life and do whatever they need to do. And it used to be a thing that nebulizers were too big and too loud and they weren't portable enough. So Teresa talked to you more about a portable version and a fixed desktop version that's available as well. But for me, for now, that's everything. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to take any. Thank you. So just to touch on that, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions at all on what James has spoken about or anything I go through, just pop question into the box and we'll get to it at the end. Um, so as James said, I'm just going to run through some of the um, diagnostic equipment and therapy equipment that you'd have in your pharmacy on a day-to-day -day basis that people may be coming in asking you questions about. Um, and I'm just going to run through um, how, to, how to use them, how to clean them. Um, and how to, how to suggest the right product for the right person. Um, so the peak flow meter, as James has already pointed out, these are always in the pharmacy. The doctor would often um, ask somebody to pop in and get one just to monitor their peak flow reading at home. Um, so this is called the peak exp expiratory flow rate. Um, and by monitoring that, people with COPD can see what's normal for them. So as James said, you pull the red tab back to zero, you stand up and you take a deep breath, you seal, you seal it around your lips and you take a deep breath and you blow as hard as you can and it measures in litres on the, on the uh, peak flow meter. Um, and you do this three times and you take the best reading and that's your reading for the day. Um, in the box, you also get some tabs. So you get a green tab, a yellow tab and a red tab. This allows somebody with COPD or any sort of respiratory issue to measure their own personal best peak flow their yellow stage and their red stage. Um, and that just allows somebody to see if there's any significant um, decrease, which could be a red flag that there's something underlying happening there. Um, so the green will be 80 to 100% of your own personal best. So as James said, somebody's personal best with COBT could, could be quite low. It could be in and around 300 litres um, per minute. So it's, it's, that's their best they mark that at the green, and then they can go back to that and they know that if it's below that, if, if they're hitting yellow or red, that that can be a marker that there's something underlying happening there. Um, another one that James has already touched on would be the pulse oximeter. Um, so the purpose of this is to measure the SpO2 levels, and this means it checks how well your heart is pumping oxygen through the body. Um, we had a huge amount of requests for this during COVID, um, and it's a great little product. Um, so, as James said, you just pop it on your finger. Um, it's used on one of these three fingers, so you have to make sure that the nails aren't painted, that there's no hard calluses on the finger, so that, that the pulse oximeter can get a really good, clear reading. And then it'll start to beep. So the beeping is the heart rate. So you can hear my heart rate there. And then the number for the SpO2 level should be between, as James said, um, 90 and 100 is kind of optimum. Um, but for COPD, it could be in and around. Varies, yeah. yeah. So it depends on the stage uh, as well. But yeah, they, they, I'm pretty sure that your people with COPD are generally linked into an outpatient, you know, a mm -hmm. consultant, so yeah. that they would be somewhat aware of it. And no more than a peak flow, they'd be aware of what's 
outside of their norm as well. Uh, what's normal to somebody with PO, COPD might be very abnormal, I'd hope, to me or you yes. or everybody listening and looking today. Yeah, so, so these are just products that um, a doctor or a hospital or a specialist just might say to a patient to have at home for themselves so that they can monitor and just be a bit proactive about what's going on. If they, it, it could be a sign that, um, that, they, that there's something underlying. As Jane said, if they're coming in and they're overusing their um, inhalers, it could be a sign that they may need a, um, a nebulizer or, you know, there's loads of different reasons. So it just shows that um, that they're taking it into their own hands at home, looking at their numbers and feeding that back to their caregiver. Um, we do have a Bluetooth pulse oximeter um, about to come on stream in the next couple of weeks as well, I believe. And the Bluetooth will tie into our app, which means they can just send it remotely through the app to their caregiver. So again, it just, you know, we've spoken about how people with COPD um, you, they don't want to be in the hospital. Um, it's really important that they're not brought in and hitting the red stream and um, exposing themselves to, to COVID because they are so high risk. So, the, so products like these allow them to manage their health at home. And if something is changing, that they can see that um, without it getting to a stage of being very exacerbated um, and let them get back to their GP. <clears throat> So the numbers here then in terms of uh, pulse oximeter, um, James? Yeah, it's the same uh, as what we mentioned earlier. Um, we're looking for a normal reading. Uh, don't be alarmed if you give us uh, uh, or do a SpO2 reading on somebody with stage four COPD and it would be between in the low 80s, uh, the low 80s to you and I is a huge issue. If they're low 80s, they get, uh, uh, if it's a new onset of the low 80, uh, go straight to a &E, uh, um, ask them. They're extremely hypoxic or there's a lack of oxygen in their peripheries or in their body. Uh, that could be due to the emphysema part of it, um, which is, and they can hold on to a lot of CO2 or uh, bad gases in their blood uh, but in general it's a really good tool more so when you're well and even if as Teresa was saying some GPs are great or some consultants are great at asking patients to monitor their health when they're well uh, but these products are not something that need to be prescribed um, these products they're a good indicator of maintaining good health. Um, so an SpO2 probe, even if they don't have one, they weren't advised to get one. Um, you could always ask somebody if they have one. Um, and the same with a peak flow meter, if they don't have one at home, maybe suggest they're relatively both inexpensive mm -hmm. on the grand scheme of things. Um, have one of everything there um, to maintain good health at all times. Obviously, when we, we say don't go to hospital, we mean unless it's totally necessary. Um, if it is, by all means, go to red stream, green stream, any form of a stream, get to hospital if you need to go to hospital. Um, a pulse oximeter might actually be a really good one to have in your consultation room as well. So if somebody is coming in, <clears throat> even outside of COPD, if people are over, if, if you feel that somebody is coming in a lot for their um, for their ventilator inhaler, or you feel they're overusing it, or um, if somebody is sneezing, or just to show somebody how it works, you can bring them in. <clears throat> it's easily wiped down, um, so it's a good one to kind of have um, every all the staff trained up on, so that they can read it um, and they can show customers how it works and the readings that you get from it, because it's it's a nice easy one um, for people. So in terms of nebulizers, <clears throat> there's two main types of nebulizers on the market. You'd have the compressor nebulizer um, and then you'd have the portable nebulizer. Um, so the compressor nebulizer, as James touched on, is kind of a tabletop nebulizer. It, it's loud, but it's very, very effective. It, it generates a stream of compressed air, which breaks up liquid medication, converts it into a mist, and it's easily inhaled. Um, we have two different types of compressor nebulizers in stock. We have the larger one that most people know, and then we have the smaller one, um, which is the V1 compressor nebulizer, which is a much smaller version of it. 
The feedback from the market is that this is quite big, it's quite bulky, um, it's very good at what it does, but it's not easily stowed away. Um, and it's kind of for older people, it's difficult to lift. Um, this is a much smaller version. Um, it's not as intimidating if you're an older person or if you're a young baby with asthma. Um, to see something like this coming at you. Um, they both have very high nebulization rate, fast inhalation times, um, and a high proportion of the, res um, the respiratory particles and compressed air technology. Um, they're very easily cleaned as well. Um, the portable nebulizer is one you don't see too much in pharmacies, but it's one that we would definitely recommend that you have in store. Um, people can sometimes be put off by the retail price. It does retail a little bit higher than the compressors. Um, and the reason is that it's, um, vibrating mesh technology. So it works on a battery. It's really, really small. You pop pop open the lid, you pop, you pop in the uh, medication and you press the button and it's completely silent. It works through a mess, mesh. It's an oscillating um, unit inside in the machine, um, which oscillates so fast that it breaks up the particles into a fine mist. This is a 360 degree rotation. So if you have a very young baby who needs to be using an nebulizer, um, or a very elderly person who's at home. Um, it's perfect for them because it's very, very quiet. It can be used whilst they're sleeping, so you can turn it on its side. And it's perfect for traveling. Now, it's not one that should be used instead of a compressor and nebulizer. Um, it's, even though it's completely silent, to, to have everything going the way it goes, it uses up two um, AA batteries, and I think in about two hours. It's for intermittent use. If somebody is going from hospital in going from home and carry to hospital in Dublin it's perfect for use in the car without having to bring the big tabletop one and um, if somebody is traveling by bus somebody somewhere it can be used and it can be used on an airplane if we ever get to go on one of those ever again um, so it's a great little product um, and as I said it, it fits into a little handbag and it can be turned on its side and that's a really really good um, selling point I suppose when somebody is coming in especially with a young baby who's looking for um, who's looking for a good nebulizer um, and all our nebulizers come complete with all the um, accessories as well so you get the tubing you get the two masks the, the smaller mask for um, pediatric use and the larger mask for older child and adult use um, and just to touch on the cleaning it's recommended to clean the nebulizer um, the kit the mouse the mouthpiece the nose piece and mask after each use and you're just rinsing with warm water and leaving it air dry you don't want to wipe it dry create static um, and you don't want any bits of um, cloth getting stuck to it, which might um, damage the machine. And then just disinfect it once a week. You can um, rinse it out then after the disinfection. The main casing itself just needs to be wiped down and just watch the air filter. That shouldn't be washed because it can cause blockages. Um, and lastly, we're going to touch on the humidifier. So the humidifier that we would recommend would be this one over here. So the virus. Um, it's going through COPD. I mean, obviously this isn't going to cure somebody of COPD, but it's going to help if somebody has an exacerbation of symptoms, it's going to help them with that at home. Um, or even in the workplace, I know um, in the offices here, we have a few going all the time at the moment. Um, so they're perfect for that. It's great for cold and flu seasons because any viruses or bacteria thrive in dry air with low humidity. Um, it makes us more susceptible to infection then as well as nosebleeds and dry skin. Um, and that irritates the mucous membranes in our nose and mouth and that makes it easier for the virus to infect the cells of the respiratory tract. So basically when you're all dried out, um, viruses can much easier get into your system. How a humidifier works is it puts moisture into the air, which clings onto any viruses or bacteria in the air and it pulls them to the ground so they're not airborne anymore. Um, so the use of humidifier, it may limit infection and it can help relieve um, regular cold and flu symptoms. Um, I highly recommend, I always recommend them um, for anyone who's had a new baby. They're great um, to have in a newborn baby's room if, if they start to get, you know, the cold and flus or, or the sniffles black nose, anything like that, they're perfect. Um, any sort of cold and flu season going on in any home, they're great for that. Um, there's a little uh, drawer at the back. You can put some eucalyptus oil or olive oil um, onto a little pad and that'll give um, the, that'll put it through the air as well. So this particular one has warm and cool mist settings, which is great. So it means that somebody um, who isn't well or, or has 
and exacerbation of symptoms during the summer can use the cool mist instead of the warm mist. And this particular one also has the timer. So you can set it for two, four, six hours and it's almost completely silent. So you can have it on low in your room and, um, at night and it's not going to make any sound. So it is another one that can be recommended for, for people, for partners of those who snort <laughs> in the room. Um, and we've seen as well that they're a great one for retail staff to have in a pharmacy, to have it up. Um, it's great not only for your own health because the, the hot air, the, 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 the air conditioning um, and the recirculated air all the time, it's just not good for any of us. Wearing masks all the time um, is very difficult. So having a humidifier, it, it's really good for the health in the pharmacy um, and it does help sell them as well once they're out. And then just to tie into what James was saying um, about people being proactive with their health, um, we have a LifeSense app um, and people now at the moment because of COVID are taking it upon themselves to obtain a better understanding um, and, and trying to be more proactive about their own conditions. Um, and we're striving with our app to help people to manage their symptoms and to manage their illnesses. Um, so at the moment, you we have blood pressure monitoring, we have weight management, um, we're going to have a, a, a Bluetooth um, pulse oximeter coming on stream soon and they all can tie into the app. So if somebody is at home um, and it means that they can send all their information to their caregiver from the comfort of their own home, they're not putting themselves at risk um, going down to their GP surgery um, to read their, their blood pressure or, 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 or their pulse oximetry, they can do it all at home and send it all down to them. Um, so before we get to your questions and answers, we just want to let you know um, that some of the resources that will be shared after this will be blog posts um, for you to use uh, for your pharmacy. So that'll be five simple steps to living well with COPD, some information on nebulize, nebulizers and COPD. Um, there'll be some infographics, some social media images, um, product inf images and information sheets and an in-store poster. So this is all to support um, um, COPD awareness. So we give you all the tools um, to use to, to promote COPD awareness in your pharmacies and, and on your socials. So <clears throat> so somebody asked, can pulse oximeters be used to track fitness for somebody with COPD? Yeah, potentially. Um, it can be used Obviously, we want to promote good health and maintaining a good lifestyle. Uh, fitness can be difficult to achieve, or what we describe as fitness for somebody with advanced COPD. Uh, but the easiest thing to, tr to track on fitness would be your heart rate. Um, I wouldn't be tracking your SpO2 on movement because it's not really a vital sign that's recorded too often, you know, like pre and post running or whatever. Wait until you're at rest to check your, um, uh, your saturation of oxygen. You can use the pulse oximeter to check your heart rate. Um, and that's always a good indicator of whether you've done enough, enough exercise to raise your heart rate enough to burn off some calories or I don't, uh, I don't know, I don't do much exercise <laughs> myself. I wouldn't know. Uh, I suppose it's a good way of monitoring recovery as well. Yeah. Um, so if you have done any sort of exercise, you can pop on a pulse oximeter, look at the oxygen saturation level. Um, somebody with COPD um, might see that they've pushed themselves a little too far. And we have to remember that exercise for somebody with COPD could be just a gentle walk around the block. Um, and it'll allow them to see if... Um, it'll allow them to see if they've pushed themselves a little bit too hard or maybe if they could go a little bit further. So it can definitely be used um, to track fitness for somebody with COPD. They're becoming quite, pulse oximeters are becoming quite popular in, um, in sports therapy, full stop. Um, um, elite athletes are using them now to monitor their recovery. Can they get out? Can they do another run or should they have a rest day? So it's, I suppose it's all coming down to, to, to being proactive about one's health and, and using the tools at our disposal to do so. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so one for James, can a nebulizer be used by a healthy person who's just prone to chest infections? Do they need to have asthma or COPD? They can be, uh, but you'd obviously need a prescription of your nebulizer, the drug itself that goes into the nebulizer, unless they have been advised by their GP or anybody to use a saline neb or water, basically sterile water. Um, but yeah, by all means, it can be. And in terms of what 
in the community, there's absolutely no difference in the exacerbation management in a hospital or in a community. In a hospital, their first port of call with anybody with COPD or any respiratory distress used to be we'll get a nebulizer straight away, lama, lava, lama, lava, and they're long acting um, then, uh, nebulizers. And we used to do that all the time. And then COVID came along and all of a sudden we can't use a nebulizer anywhere. Um, and it's to the detriment of COPD patients because we know that the drug being delivered is delivered in an appropriate manner to the, the, uh, the uh, to the required destination. Um, and that's the same for a healthy person versus somebody or somebody who's healthy with COPD or somebody who's really poorly with COPD. But yeah, a nebulizer isn't just for COPD, it's it's a, it's a really good device to use with, with any respiratory um, issue. But um, prone to chest infections is chronic bronchitis potentially uh, can develop over years. COPD, as we said, doesn't start until the 40s, generally speaking, with smoking or toxins and chronic chest infections. So try to get to the bottom, bottom of the, the chest infections, something like a humidifier or keep track of what causes the, the chest infections. You know, if it's in a certain area, you're working with dust, seeking to try and limit all of them because more and more chest infections cause more and more damage. Um, and that's not idea um can you use essential oils on the humidifiers <clears throat> excuse me both our humidifiers have a little either a little drawer <clears throat> or a little section at the back which pops out and there's some pads so you can just put a couple of drops of the essential oils onto the pads and pop it back in and you get um, a spare um, packet of the pads um, when you buy your humidifiers as well so yeah you can absolutely use the essential oils um, in the humidifiers on the little pads at the back. Don't put it directly into the water. Um, and somebody else has asked if the meeting is available online to view and it absolutely will be. We've recorded this so we can uh, send it out for you to use with your staff. Um, so thank you all very much for joining us today. That's all the questions. Um, if you have any further questions, you can contact myself and James directly and we'd be delighted to help you after this. Um, and thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you.